because last week we had the same week. I don't know why things take place, but you know what? We had our highest Sunday in a certain category. Last Sunday, I need you to celebrate crazy with me. We had 26 people come to know Jesus. Can we make some noise for that? That's why we do what we do. Who cares about the projector? Who cares about the light? Come on, somebody got saved. I just want to say how awesome our volunteers are. Megan and Natalie back there running around. Come on, show them some love. The projectors fell like four times and things are going out. Let's give all of our volunteers a hand. Can you show them some love? We wouldn't exist without it. Usually we have an offering segment and an announcement segment and some cool videos, but I sure love it when the Holy Spirit takes over. Amen? Amen. What a beautiful sound it is when we worship together. When we worship together, we leave here feeling like we can take on anything. That's what this series has been about. And we're going to dive into it. And I'll mention, if it's your, I'll say this, if it's your first time, we would love to stay connected with you. This is a connect card. Please grab it. Follow along with us and fill it out. And you can drop it off at the red table on your way out. There's also, you can give on your way out there. There's multiple ways to give. And, and so we'll, I'll mention that maybe again at the end. I just feel led to just dive right into the message. Amen. Anybody come ready for the word? Yeah, man. Come on, if you're new to Elevate, you're going to learn we're not the church of the chosen and the frozen. We serve a God who's alive, so we act alive. That just means we can preach. Say, amen. amen. Say, come on. Come on. Preach a white word. Say, holla. You just got to preach with the brother, all right? We like to have fun in Elevate. I know the Texans are on, so I'll preach quick if you shot me down. Does that work? Man, oh, man, oh, man. And so, uh... <laughs> If you will, turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Many of you guys know, I'm going to put them on the spot and say hi, but many of you guys know we planted through an organization called the Ark Association of Related Churches. And because of them, we have the success today. How many are thankful for the Ark? Amen. They believe that the local church is the hope of the world. We plant more churches, we can reach more people. Amen. And uh, we just celebrated as a Association of launching over 500 church plants. Can we give it up for that? Come on, show that some love. You're a part of that. How you give and how you tie goes into all of those who plant, and there's those that are planting this weekend as well. And we got somebody on staff from the Arca with us. Derek is in the house. Show us some love, Derek, man. Oh, come on, show us some other big love. Hey, we're so glad you're here, buddy. And you win socks of the day. I'm just telling you right now. Woo! You are the man, man. It's an honor to have you here. This house loves the ark, and we would be here if it wasn't for you guys, man. So we love it. Let's give it up for Derek and the ark one more time. Derek, it's an honor to have you with us today. Today, I just want to wrap up our decade series. If you've been with us, our decade series has been geared around the progression as a believer. That's why we celebrate the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, and to just really walk out what it means to be a progression of a believer, because how many know that one year from now, you don't want to be the same you. Maybe I'll say that over here because some of y'all didn't want to admit that. How many of you, you don't want to be the same you? Can I get yeah. You don't want to, bro. And so, and so, here's the deal. We must always grow as a believer, amen? And we talked multiple things. We talked about the progress of grace and how we should grow in grace and knowledge when somebody knows the truth, but we don't give them the progress of grace to understand. Grace is not something that is prostituted. It's something that is celebrated. Talk about the progress of grace, and this week I want to wrap up the decade series. I really kind of want to just talk it out with you. And I know there might be some quiet moments, there'll be some times we can have fun together, but I just really want to walk out what is in my heart with you today, something that I'm going through, something that many of us are going through ourselves. Let me let me set this up, we'll pray, and then we'll go, because I know Joy's hands are tired from worshiping for like two hours today, and she's working in keys. Y'all give it up for Joy. Yeah. Hey, Mark chapter 5, look at verse 21. Y'all know I got fired up because I took my jacket off. Oh, I'm ready to preach. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. If you're there, say, yep. Yeah. You can look on the screens as well or on your phones. Jesus got into the boat again, and he went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, his name was Jairus, was Jairus arrived. 
When he saw Jesus, he fell to his feet, pleading with him, my little daughter is dying. He said, I'm going to kind of skim through this whole chapter uh, for sake of time. He said, please come lay hands on her. Verse 24, Jesus went, and on his way, verse 24, a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors. Notice he was 12 years searching many doctors. And over the years, she had spent everything she had. She gave all of her own effort, her time, her money, and resources. But yet it says that she got worse. Verse 27, she had heard about Jesus. Notice she had heard about him. He wasn't the first response. So she came up behind him through the crowd, and he touched, she touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. And we know the story, right? Immediately, somebody shout immediately. Immediately, it stopped. And he could feel her, he could, Jesus, she could feel her whole body. And she had been healed from her terrible condition. Verse 30, Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him, and he shouted, who touched me? And his disciple says, Jesus, who ain't touched you? Imagine, they're like, man, thinking Jesus tripping, bro, you're surrounded by a crowd. There are a lot of people touching you, bro. He said, who touched me? And we know, to skim down the story, that Jesus, the lady said, it is me. He said, woman, your faith has made you whole. I'll go. Then in verse 35, we pick up in the story where while he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus and told the leader of the synagogue, he was a leader in the city, and he told his daughter, or he told to tell Jesus, your daughter is now dead. There's no need in troubling the teacher now. Jesus overheard it. He said, don't be afraid. Have faith. They went and they got there, and in verse 40, or right there in verse 39, there was a lot of commotion and weeping and and people were crying, and Jesus said, don't cry. She's asleep. She ain't dead. And then it says in verse 40, the crowd laughed, a.k.a. don't laugh at Jesus. I almost titled that this sermon today, don't laugh at Jesus. That'll preach from some other time. That just means you got to come back. Then we know the story, right? He kicked the people out. Sometimes you got to kick distraction out. Sometimes you got to kick the noise out. Sometimes you got to kick the crowd out. Anybody ever met a bunch of negative people? You just want to go on a slapping reel, just psh, psh, psh. come on, don't lie up in church. Don't look at them. I just said, sorry. All right, so, so he said, cry, and then Jesus went in there and said, Talitha Tokohum. I think that's right, Talitha Tokohum. Little girl, get up. And we know that she was saved and she was healed. Amen. So, quick recap Jesus jumped in a boat. He shows up to a crowd. He's preaching to a bunch of people. And all of a sudden, a leader of the city comes up and says, hey, I need you to come save my daughter. So Jesus, in mid-sermon, walks off the stage to lead the thousands to go take care of the one. Then on the way, he gets distracted again by a lady with the issue of blood to save her. And while he's saving her, Jairus' daughter is dead. And he says, hey, fear not. So he shows up at the house, people laughing. He, he kicks them out, and the girl got healed, and everybody celebrated. Woo. How many would agree that that's a busy day? Come on, anybody in the house. It's a real busy day. How many would agree, though, that every single situation was important? Every single situation, there was a need. There wasn't one that was more than the other. Has anybody ever been believing for something or in the progress of trying to fix a certain area in your life, in your family, in your ministry, or whatever it may be, but distractions feel like they keep coming up? Come on, anybody in the house? It feels like the, you feel pulled from six different ways. And you know they're all important, but how do I choose which one in the midst of the situation? So in other words, here's a phrase that we're going to walk through today. And I want you to get this down, write it down. And here's my challenge to you is be careful not to confuse distraction with God's direction. Be careful not to confuse distraction from God's direction. Because what may feel like a distraction, man, I ain't got time for this. When you say it to your teenage kid, I ain't got time for this foolishness again. Is it distraction or is it God's direction opening up the door for you to help find the miracle? Come on, is anybody with me in the house? So if you're taking notes, here's the time of my sermon. Simply this, the gift of distraction. The gift. Somebody say the gift of distraction. Of dis distraction, I know, we need to shut it out. Distraction can be bad. 
But at the same time, distraction can stop progression. And if you can learn, though, that maybe all of these things in our life is not a distraction, but it could be God's direction to help bring wholeness into our family, our marriage, our workplace, our ministry. Come on, is anybody with me in the house? Y'all follow me? Can I get an amen on that? Jesus, do what you do today. Speak how you speak and help the Houston Texans right now in Jesus' name. And the church said amen. And the Houston Astros and the church said amen and amen and not the Cowboys. And somebody said amen in the church. <laughs> Man, y'all just lost all spiritualness. Y'all give it up for the word one more time, will you? Amen. So just want to walk this out with you over the next, next few minutes here. Simply is, let me ask you this, the gift of distraction. The gift of distraction. You know, I was uh, listening to a young leader, and the young leader, this question was presented inside the room with a bunch of other leaders, and the question was, what do you think a pastor should be today? And you know, the young dude, you could tell he's a little bit hurt, or maybe he was struggling with some stuff, and, and, but some of it he was right. I mean, he was like, man, I'm ready for a pastor that smells like sheep. They stink like sheep. They smell like sheep, and they want to hang around people, and they need to be with people. Can I tell you, I agree with that, you know what I'm saying? We need to be around people. We got a whole lot of churches where the green room is more in the back instead of the foyer with the people. And so we need to be around people. I get that. But he was like, man, he said, I think a pastor should every answer, every, answer every single phone call, answer every single request, be available at all times, day and night. And I thought to myself, what about my wife and kids? And I hear what he's saying. And then an older gentleman spoke up and said, son, you're right. P good pastors are those who are around people. And I believe that's why we call this church Elevate People, because we believe in being with the people. Amen. But can I tell you, though, this old man says, son, you're right, we need to be with people, but hear me, young man. He said, if we are always available to everyone, then we will have nothing to give anyone. If we're always available to everyone, then we will have nothing to give anyone. I set that example up to open up a conversation with you with the question is, how open should your door be in your life? All the activities, all the demands of work, all the demands of your children, all the demands of life with family and marriage and all these distractions, how open should your door be? Are you afraid to, if you don't respond with the text message in 30 seconds, all of a sudden, oh, they think I ain't going to love them? You got to respond to every text message. You got to respond to everything. Come on, how many like me, man? You just want to love on people and you don't want to let people down. Anybody like that in the house? How many are like, man, leave people alone? I don't want to talk to them. Come on, where you at? Don't lie for church. Okay, so that's why you're here at church. We're going to help you. All right, so, but the deal is, man, it's like, man, what should I do? Should I do this? Should I take every single phone call, man? Do I need to put my kids in all these activities because they only live once, man? I don't want them to miss anything. Ah! Anybody ever feel like that in life? You just want to go, ah, when you wake up in the morning and at lunchtime you want to go, ah, <laughs> and at nighttime you want to go, ah, because life is crazy, right? Things happen, but can I tell you, in the progress of life, how do you discern the demands? Come on, is anybody with me? Because your marriage is real, your family is real, your ministry is real, your, your, your job is real. How do you discern the demand? How do you know what is distraction versus direction? How, how do we know? Can a distraction actually be a, gift, be a gift from God as direction to find the miracle that you're looking for? In your marriage, in your family, you hate your job, but God sent you there, but all of a sudden you hit the place that he sent you. So is this just distraction or is this direction? Come on, are y'all following me in the house? Talk about the progress of life. So, so in order to understand the gift of distraction, you got to understand how to discern demands. How many, somebody say, how to discern demands. That's point number one if you want to write that down for all my A personalities in the house. You know what I'm saying? Got to get your points. I'm not so much of an A personality. I'm more like, hey, what's up? You know what I'm saying? All right, so it's the A per Point number one, how do you discern these demands? How many would like to know when you got six important things going on, how do you choose which one is which? Anybody in the house? Two people while I'm preaching to y'all. All right, so let me throw this illustration out a little bit further. I thought to help illustrate this even more, how to discern the demands, that I'll give you what it looks like in the week in the life of a pastor. Now, just so you know, this is what I'm called to do. I get to do this full time, and I am honored 
to get to do that. But just so you know, my week starts off on Monday. Monday is our staff day and our leadership day planning and all that. Tuesday is my day. I set my side of time and I study all day long. And then after Tuesday, Wednesday, I usually study a little bit more and I wrap it up because it takes a whole lot of work. It don't come easy to me. I work hard at trying to put my sermon together. Y'all thankful for that? Anybody? Yeah, Amy, I got five people on that one. Hey, hey, right there. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just kidding. All right, so, but man, I work hard on that. And then, and then Thursday, I usually meet with people. And Friday, I'm with my boo, my rib. That's my wife, in case y'all didn't figure that out. Okay, I'm with, so, so if you try to call me on Friday, I want you to know, man, I love you Saturday through Thursday. And I'm here for you, but not on Fridays. Come on, somebody, that's my day off. I mean, I, if you call me, don't be offensive. I love you, but just not on Fridays, okay? So, but that's my day, that's my life. And so, some, one time, I just, you get to points where you're so tired. You're like, man, God, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? So a Wednesday came, and, and I knew that I needed to finish my sermon, but the, the community pools were still open, so I went out to the pool to just try to get some relaxed time and clear my mind. And, and all of a sudden, about 30 minutes in, I started getting itchy. It's like, man, I gotta go finish a sermon. I'm like, man, people are counting on me to put together a sermon. I mean, y'all are counting on me to put together a sermon every week, am I right? I mean, okay, so, but, but I, I got to, uh, you're counting on me to do that, I know. And, and so I take it so serious, I'm like, I feel like if I do anything else that is not prepping to bring you the best that I can, then I feel like I'm failing you. Failing, and so I'm like, I get itchy, I'm like, man, man, forget this. And I'm with my wife, I'm just, not, I'm going to work on the tan later, baby, I'm sorry. And so, and so I come back home and I'm in the groove, man. I'm grooving out, and all of a sudden I get a phone call. And that phone call is somebody that I'm mentoring. And I've told him, you can call me at any time and any day. Come on, my mentors in the house ever said that. And then they call at the exact time when you ain't got no time. Come on, where you at? You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to say who it is or point at you or anything like that. But, but the deal is, is like, I was like, man, I'm in a group. I got to put together this sermon. We got to try to win 26 more people to the Lord. You know, this is important, man. But he needs me. He needs me. So after the second phone call, I took the phone call, step outside, and I start talking to him a little bit. And as I'm talking to him, those of you, it's your first time here to Elevate. My wife and I, we have, we have four children, three daughters and a boy, all under the age of seven. Pray for a brother. You know what I'm saying? All right. So, and, so, and so I'm on the phone outside, and my daughter, my kids come walking in and start tapping me on, the, Daddy, Daddy, we got something to show you. Daddy, and I did what all of us do and go, yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah, amen, bro. Oh, man, that is so good. Praise God. I'm celebrating with you. Come on, how many in the house are with me? You don't hear, but maybe two seconds of the conversation. People are into liars up in church. And so, and so, how many have done it to me? Oh, this just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. And so, <laughs> done it to you. All right, so anyway, all right. But here's the deal. It's like, man, it's like my kids are pulling on them. I said, get away. They go away and they come back and they got a little bitty chalkboard. And on the chalkboard it says, it says, Daddy, you're invited to the club. And I was like, oh. And I went, I said, man, praise God. <laughs> and it was the Tinkerbell Club. Y'all don't know nothing about no Tinkerbell Club until you've been a dad with three daughters when my dad and daughter's in the house. By the way, it's in Pixie Hollow, just in case you didn't know. So, be like, take a bounce. So I'm like, oh my God, I'm torn. I gotta, <laughs> man, I need to talk to this dude. Man, he needs me in this deep moment. It's like, what's going on? I told him, I said, bro, I'm sorry, I gotta go, man. I gotta go to the club. <laughs> Probably should explain that one a little bit further. But, but I went in and, bro, it was one of the coolest moments with my kids. They had it decked out. They had it planned. They had the rules for the Tinkerbell Club. They had it all down. They made it clear that when I step into the club, I ain't daddy, I'm a friend. And so I followed the rules and I loved it, but can I tell you, it was great going to the club. But friends, I think about that day and I ask myself, all were important, which one was a distraction? I need to be there for the people that I'm pastoring. I need to be there for my children. But you're all counting on me to put together a message to win people to Jesus. How do I discern where to pull from in the moment in time? Come on, am I preaching anybody? 
And I mean, what, what, what I, I mean, imagine if next week you came, worship was amazing, the, it's just glorious, and Will's up here just going, thank you, Lord. You know what I'm saying? Y'all seen Will? It's just like. So it's so. <laughs> my boy Will in the house. Give it up for Will, worship leader. So, bro, it's all good. And so, and so man, it's just, it's just so good. You're worshiping, the announcements are there, and, and everything, and all of a sudden at the end, Somebody comes up and says, man, thank you for coming to Elevate today, bro. Man, we're so, man, Pastor Brandon wished he could have been here today. But Pastor Brandon couldn't be here. He had something come up. He's at the club. He's at the what? No, it's the Tinkerbell Club. He couldn't make it to church today. And you tell me, in that midst of that moment, you're like, you kidding me? I got all my kids up, I got them dressed, fed, I fought my wife all the way to church, and I get here, and you ain't preaching? Come on, somebody, how many getting fights on the way to church more than anybody? Where you at in the house? Get on. Get up. But are you here? So my question is, friends, help me understand, which one was the distraction? In the battle of life, every single day, my daily battle is trying to define what is distraction and what is direction. How do I discern the demand? When do I know I need to spend more time at work than at family? Because if I don't work, I can't provide for my family. When do I need to decide, especially the moms and the spouses in here, the moms and the mothers, man, how do I balance time with my kids and time with my husband? How do I balance life, work, ministry, job, time? Anybody with me in the house? It's like, man, God, you're pulling on me from all these different directions. What do I do? Don't get confused between what is distraction and could be God's direction. The gift of distraction. What do I do if one keeps on distracting me from fulfilling the other? How do I discern? Jesus was a master at discerning these things. He was here for three years. He had way more things than we got going on. And he did it in three years and he changed the world. He knows how to discern the demands. How many would say, man, Pastor, man, if I could just get three days away, I can handle all these distractions in my life. Come on, where you at? I'm like, just time away, I can handle everything. Where you at in my house? Come on, help me out. You know what I'm saying? It's like, man, get me away. Take me to the beach. Right, you know what I'm saying? Take me, take me downtown. Just get me to Bora Bora. You know what I'm saying? Take me to Hawaii. I'm preaching now, y'all ain't even shouting it down. You know what I'm saying? Get me to God. I'm just kidding. But... Take me somewhere that I can relax and I can figure all this out. Friends, I hear that it's good to get away, to get clarity, but do not miss the power of what Mark 5 is trying to teach us. Jesus did not discern the demands in the midst from a solitary place. He discerned the demands in the midst of the crowd. He knew what to do in the busyness of life when life was crazy and pulling on you from all different directions, Jesus had a gift to discern in the midst of the crazy. You got to be encouraged because you have the same image as Jesus. Not only did he put the same gift in you to discern in the midst of the craziness of life, but how many thankful if you just cry out, Jesus will come speak to you in the midst of the crowd. Can I get an amen in the house on that? Don't miss the power that the goal is to understand that God will speak to you in the crowd. And we see this with Jairus. Jesus is in mid-conversation. He's in the middle of his message. And Jairus comes walking up. He is a city leader. He's coming from the capital. And he says, hey, I need you to help my daughter. I can just see him interrupting him because he's a city leader so Jesus recognizes him, and he gives honor to him, and he says, hey, my daughter needs help. And Jesus is mid-sermon, and he says, okay, he don't even say nothing. He just turns, and he walks off the stage. Exactly. If I, if I were in the crowd, I'd be like, are you kidding me? I just spent all my money. I just gave blood to get gas money on the camel. It ain't cheap, camel gas. And to get all the way to come watch you preach you. I went six hours, and you for real, for real, you going to get up and just walk off? Come on, somebody. Y'all with me in the house. You're telling me Jesus didn't know that the people needed to hear Jesus? Jesus had an opportunity to preach and win the gospel. 
but yet he left to pursue the one. This is a beautiful story that Jesus has and God has for the love of a one. That's why a core value here at Elevate is we go after the one. This is why I love Jesus. Because the world says when distraction hits, leave the one to go save the 99. But Jesus says, leave the 99 to go save the one. Why? Because you're back. Why? It, that doesn't make sense, am I right? But when you learn to discern between what is distraction and what is direction, you tend to find that in every situation you're going to have to put a little bit of faith in it. Come on, am I, am I talking to anybody in the house? How do we do this? Jesus lived in crowds. We live a crowded life. And we live in this false fantasy like things are going to slow down someday. Every year we have birthdays for my four kids. It gets louder and it gets crazier. It ain't slowing down, boo. Am I right? Life ain't so. So how do you discern in the midst of the crazy? Jairus, man, think about this guy. He was a leader in the city, but he was willing to leave his work to go after the one. He was willing to put the work aside to go save his family and to be here with his family. Let me say that's a good father in the house. Because I get it. For many of us men, we understand we're the provider. God put the gift and the ability in us. And we're like, man, if I don't work, then you ain't going to live like you want to live. Well, what good is work if you ain't got the love of your wife? What good is work if your kids want to be everywhere else but at home? How, how do we discern? You can win in all areas. Are you with me, church? But how do you discern the gift of distraction, what may feel like distraction, but is actually a direction for God to do? So you got to discern the demands. And then you got to learn that the gift of distraction, point number two, distraction will help you. Locate the leaks. Let me say it like this. Distraction will help you locate the bleeding. Help you locate the bleeding. We see this with the lady with the issue of blood in verse 24 through 29. The lady, she had the issue of blood for how many years? Do y'all remember? For 12 years. And she searched every doctor to try to find out what's wrong. She went to gain her own knowledge to go and find out for 12 years, spend her own time, her own money, to try to go figure it out every other way other than, the Je than Jesus. Because we know the Bible says she knew about Jesus, but for 12 years she tried to do things in her own strength and in her own knowledge. And it hit me. I wonder how many of us in here today are bleeding with passion for life, passion for our marriage, passion for our family. Passion for the dream that God put inside of us. To start a ministry. To plant a church. To go start a business. What we're bleeding, how many of us are bleeding with the passion because of the distraction of knowledge? The Bible says, don't get me wrong, the Bible says we perish because of lack of knowledge. It's good to get knowledge, but how many would agree 12 years is a long time? And the Bible says she searched for her own knowledge. She tried to do it her own way, and things got worse and worse. How many would agree when you try to do it your way, things don't seem to get better? They seem to get worse. It's amazing when things happen. We tend to run from Jesus instead of run to Jesus. So the question I want to throw at you is this. Is the distraction you're facing coming from the knowledge of you trying to fix the problem yourself? We, we got to get, the, man, I hope y'all hear it. Maybe it's just sinking in real deep to you. I don't know. But, but I hope you're hearing me today. Because we can easily get caught up in trying to fix it with our own strength. Then now you become distracted from putting it back in God's hands. Because it says in verse, in verse 27 that she had heard about Jesus. So in other words, Jesus was her last resort and not her first response. I wonder how many times we go through things. And we don't give Jesus the first opportunity to take care of it all. But we try to do it ourselves. We try to get out and be the provider. Especially us men, we deal with this more than anything, leading our marriage, leading our family, leading our business and our ministry, and those around us. I'm a go-getter guy. If I see something wrong, I'm going to just go do it myself. But it's amazing how many times I try to go because of the knowledge that I have. 
Instead of giving God the opportunity, now because I did it myself, I think it's a distraction, but it's only because of the knowledge that I tried to do it myself. God, man. Here, here, here. We, it's amazing when things go wrong. We forget about who's the answer. And when you try to fix things yourself, can I tell you, when it comes to life, you ain't a handyman. When it comes to life, you ain't a plumber. When it comes to life, you're not a fixer-upper. If you try to do things on your own, can I tell you, sooner or later, friends, you will begin to leak and you will begin to bleed. And all of a sudden, the distractions that you're facing because you don't know how to discern and give time here, give time there, and do that, all of a sudden now, you get frustrated to a point, your passion starts leaking, your love for God stops leaking, your love for people stops leaking, your passion for your spouse stops leaving, and all of a sudden, you find yourself hurting because you've gotten out of touch with Jesus. But the cool thing is, we're going to close this thing out. In verse 30, 31, the Bible says that she touched him and the power went out. She touched him and the power went out. Friends, how many would agree that the power to fix your situation lies in the touch? That deserves at least a 90% better amen than you're giving right now. How many would agree that the power to fix your marriage, the power to fix your family, the power to discern the demands, the power to fix your financial problems, the power to help you out in school, the power comes with the touch. So my question to you, if you're struggling, discerning between what you seems like a distraction, addiction is coming again, things are hurting again, pain is, is surfacing again, and all of a sudden you think it's a distraction, but it's actually a direction from God to wake you up to help you realize that you got a leak and you're bleeding. You see, this is why distraction is a gift. Because we don't want distraction. God kicked it, Jesus kicked it out of the house. But how many would agree is that if we can learn that distraction can be a gift, it has actually given us direction to know that, hey, I'm bleeding somewhere and I need to get back in touch with Jesus. If my marriage is failing, guess what? What's the key? Get back in touch. If my family needs healing, get back in touch. If my, if my job needs healing, get back in touch. When you're in the midst of ministry, and can I tell you, it happens, and things are taken away, and things shift, and there's those days in life where you're like, Jesus, why am I even living? God, what's going on? God did not make a mistake when he created you. Just get back in touch with the creator, and he'll keep everything on track. You are not a mistake. You were born an original. Don't die a copy. Don't try to think, don't, you don't think you need to change anything. You are who you are. The calling is real. The marriage is real. The relationship is real. What you're needing is right in front of you. But don't let distractions stop you from believing that God wants to do something great through you. The gift of distraction. Is this making sense to anybody today? And the last thing is this. We have... Jesus left the crowd, saved the girl, but the girl died because it got stopped by the lady. Jesus recognized the opportunity of distraction. Your, your story is not that way, but you may wake up and your marriage is going to hell. You're like, man, you woke up and you're like, man, I think this is it, it's over. You go to work, but everything in you is tugging. I need to take a day off. But you don't. Because you got to work. But you got to focus on your marriage. And you got to go to work to get some extra hours, but you're not showing up for your kids' t ball game. Yeah, I, I got to do it. I, everything. And so you're waking up, you're like, man, what? So there's different areas in your life. So how do you know how to choose to keep it all left healthy? Don't forget that God put the gift in you decide in the midst of the crowd on where to go and what to do. I hope this is helping somebody. Because the last thing is this, if you want to know how to determine between what is distraction and God's direction, follow the pull. 
Somebody say, follow the pool. Follow the pool. Jesus was in the midst of the crowd, and people kept pushing him. People kept pushing, pushing, pushing. But then you had one daddy, and you had one lady that they didn't push. They pulled, and they got God's attention. So many times when all hell breaks loose and things take place, how many would agree we tend to push God? God, where you at, man? Where you at? Where you at? We push here. We push there. We try to do it our way. We try to do it our methods. And we push and we push when all we need to do is pull. It's a pull. God put it inside of you. His name is the Holy Spirit. And in the moments when you don't know what to do, follow the pull. Follow the pull. You see, Jesus will not respond to a push, but he can't help but respond to a pull. Get back in touch with Jesus, whatever area that is. But keep on pulling. When you don't know what to do, do I pick marriage, kids, you may just need to lock your kids in a room for two hours so you can go and have time to bounce with your wife and your boo. Come on, somebody, I'm preaching now. I'm telling you right now, there's one key to fix every single argument in marriage. Get butt naked and try to fight. Oh, come on, somebody. Somebody shout hallelujah. It's the truth. Come on, your kids are going to be okay. They ain't dying. Come on, discern the demand. Are y'all following me? That's, come on, somebody. I mean, learn. You got, where do you do? Put. It's amazing how we get so frustrated because you're not putting enough faith in the areas where God says, hey, let me take it. What is distraction? Verse. Sir. Man, God wants you to have a healthy marriage. He wants you to have a healthy family. He wants you to have a healthy ministry. He wants you to have a healthy business. I love doing ministry, but this ministry ain't going to kill my marriage. This ministry is not going to kill my family. But all can succeed if I learn to figure out what's distraction and what's direction. Come on, let's stand together. When you don't know what to do, follow the pull of your heart. You'll never go wrong when you follow the Holy Spirit. You'll never go wrong. Some of you in here, you may not know what the Holy Spirit is. You're like, how can I believe in something that I don't see? The Holy Spirit is like the wind. You don't see it, you feel it. You thought about it even from the simple thing of thinking about stealing a Twinkie that one time in the gas station. Your mom and daddy didn't tell you no, but something inside is like, don't do it. Follow the pool. Follow the pool. Am I crazy to believe that this house can be a house full of healthy marriages, full of healthy families, full of healthy visions, launching out churches, launching out ministries, launching out businesses? We, if we can learn to discern the pool. Thank you, Jesus, that I've applied this to my life. We wouldn't have had the worship experience we had. We didn't follow the pool. Follow the pool. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Here's my question to you. We're, prayer team, come and join me. Prayer team, come and join me. We're going to close out here, guys, in three minutes. We are one minute over. Two minutes now. We're going to close out here in three minutes. If you're here today, my pastor B, bro, I've gotten out of touch with Jesus. I've been bleeding in some areas. Yeah, maybe you're a good Christian, but there was a time when you were stronger. Maybe you were, you have a good prayer life, but there was a time when it was greater. Yeah, you love the worship, but there was a time when it was higher. You've been leaking. You've been bleeding. Can I tell you, I got the fix to the leak. His name is Jesus. Life may be crazy. Your marriage may be on edge. Your family might be on edge. That addiction is trying to creep back into your life. It took everything away from you. Can I tell you, we can fix it today. 
You just need to get back in touch with Jesus. If, I'm, if you're here today, shoot your hand up. You need to say, I need to get back in touch with Jesus. Shoot it up and keep it up. Shoot it up and keep it up. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Here's what I'm going to ask. I'm going to pray. If you raise your hand, we want to pray with you. Church, remember, like we said, worship is our response to God's awesomeness. When God has done something awesome, we're going to worship and we're going to pray. If you need prayer for anything, even if I didn't mention it, life is crazy. You just want somebody to pray with you to find peace. Maybe you need a healing in your body. I don't know what it is. Can I tell you? Take these next few minutes as we worship together and we pray. Give God an opportunity in the midst of the crowd to do a miracle. Can we do that, church? Amen? We're going to worship loud together from your seats. And those of you who need prayer, you raise your hand. Anybody else, go ahead and start moving your way forward. Everybody else, lift your hands. Lift your hands and let's pray. And let's worship. If you need prayer, go ahead and start moving your way forward. Father, we thank you. Jesus, we glorify you. Thank you, Father, that we can learn to discern your spirit, that we can follow the pool. Father, those who are out of touch with you, Father, I pray that we get back in touch with you, Jesus. We crave your worship. We crave your word. We crave your prayer, Father, like never before, God. Father, we thank you for all the marriages and all the fa families. We speak healing and restoration, God. And, Father, we thank you for the miracle. We're letting everything go. We're putting it in your hands, God, and we give it to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Thanks again for joining us today. If you've been impacted by any way by today's sermon, this ministry, we would love to hear about it. Email us your story at mystory@elevatepeople.tv. If you would like to help support this ministry, please go online to elevatepeople.tv, hit the Donate tab, the Giving tab, and help us continue what God is doing here at Elevate. We love you so much. Thanks again for joining, and have a great day.